Hi, everyone. My name is Kathy Fong. I'm a first year PhD student at MIT Media Lab, here with my co-authors Fernanda de la Torre, PhD student at MIT, and Dr. Bill Huang from RPI. I'm presenting LLMR, real-time prompting of interactive worlds using large language models. This work was done during our internship at Microsoft Research. We would like to thank our mentors, Andre, Judith, and Jaren. Ever since the conception of virtual reality, we have been dreaming of scenarios where teachers could use VR to create interactive materials for classroom use or frontline workers to create simulations in real time. However, this is far from reality because creating a 3D virtual world is a challenging task that requires both artistic and technical skills, and existing contents become deprecated because platform and devices upgrade. With generative AI, people can not only create new texts, images, but also 3D contents such as objects, scenes, and skyboxes. And a list of examples has since outgrown, but as of now, they mainly exist in visual space where they lack interactivity. In addition, these diffusion-based methods often require a substantial time and compute to generate while the quality and resolution is limited. We would like to present Large Language Model for Mixed Reality, or LLMR for short, a framework for the real-time creation and modification of interactive mixed reality experiences using LLMs. Let me start with a very simple example. Let's say I want to create a car and it has to have some color, such as the body's red, the wheels have to be black, the headlights yellow, and I also want to be able to control it with WASD keys. I can do so by describing the properties and behavior I want. After I'm satisfied with my creation, I can also save it and reload it into a different scene, in this case, a moon terrain, and the behavior of the car is just the same as expected. Besides for gaming and entertainment, which are the obvious use cases, we also created the following scenarios. Many of us have run into problems with instruction manuals, but imagine that with our framework, you can have an interactive guide that allows you to ask questions such as, am I doing the right thing or which button should I press? And for example, one of our authors happens to be colorblind. And if you are an architect, you can prompt your building model on how accessible it is for a red-green colorblind user. We all know that a picture is worth a thousand words. Users can also draw things into existence by prompting a magic paintbrush. Our framework works across devices and platforms. In a scenario of rescue planning, the helicopter operator can prompt a simulation in mixed reality. And users can also connect mobile devices like their phone and smartwatch to give our framework access to sensor data. Now I'd like to hand it over to Bill to go through each module of the framework. Let's use this very simple example here. Here we have a virtual scene, which is a children's room, and we'll focus on this teddy bear in the middle. Let's say as a user, my request is to make the teddy bear twice as big. For the framework to do this request, it first needs to understand it uh, in relation to the room that we have. So basically it needs to be able to locate this bear among the many objects in this room. To able to achieve this, we first parse the room into a string representation containing all the objects, their names, location and relations, and we use this string as input to a module called a scene analyzer. The scene analyzer will then try to locate the relevant object and then use that as the output. We'll also query another GPT called the skill library, which is more used for specialized purposes, we'll explain later. It is not needed here because our request is fairly generic. We'll then pass the output of the scene analyzer to a builder GPT which is another GPT. The responsibility for him is to generate code that is supposed to carry out the request in the virtual scene. Before we actually execute his generated code, however, we first will pass it to an external inspector GPT. And the inspector will check this code for any potential errors. In this case, it will find an error, and then it will relay the suggestion back to the builder as to how to fix this error. The builder will then try again, and then relay the modified code back to the inspector. The inspector will now see that the error has been fixed. And then this code is now passed to a compiler, which will then compile and execute this code at runtime. And then we'll see that the scene will actually go through the desired change. The teddy bear is twice as big. We have also developed another module called the planner GPT. And this goes before everything I've explained in the previous framework as the user you may only have very vague ideas of what you want to achieve. So for example, you want to create a kitchen, uh, but you may not have thought about, you know, all the objects that have gone into the kitchen, you know, you may not have thought about what the color of the kitchen was. You just know that you kind of vaguely want to create
create a kitchen. In this case, it's very helpful for you to discuss your idea with kind of an external agent. That is where the planner GPT comes in. Basically, you will have a conversation, and then by the end of it, the planner GPT will summarize the conversation into a plan that's something like this, which is a list of itemized instructions. You can execute the instructions in order uh, with our previous framework, and then th this is the result that you will get. We have also developed so-called memory management. All the modules in the framework are large language models. And by default, they, the language models will remember everything that has happened before, basically all the historical interactions, and then it will generate the text conditional on those historical information. We have found, however, that that mode, which we called full memory, is not ideal for our application. The main constraint is token size limits. So to make our framework more scalable, we have uh, actually limited the memories of almost all the modules in our framework. And we found that this makes the model both perform better and, and it's also more scalable. Let me touch upon um, skills, which is carried out by the skill library GPT that we have mentioned before, uh, but was not used in the toy experiment. So here we experimented with uh, creation of animations on 3D models with large language models. The idea is that we can use large language models to generate structured texts and we can then parse these texts, which contains kind of time series for the rotational motion on each joint of the 3D model. This can be parsed into a motion and then be played on the 3D model to create motion. The text I'm showing here on the bottom can be parsed into the swimming animation on the whale uh, as shown above. We found language models to be benefiting a lot from in-context learning on this particular task. So if there's existing animations, we'll parse those into text and use those as demonstrations. So in this case, we'll use the swimming animation as demonstration, and then we'll ask GPT to generate five more animations, such as wiggling the tail or swimming aggressively. Um, the generated animations, as you can see, are very different from the demonstration we gave it. Another skill is the object retriever. Let's take the user request, create a room with a clock, a chair, a picture frame, and an apple on a table. To do this, we interface LLMR with both DALI and Sketchfab API. DALI allows us to generate images of the objects we're looking for, and Sketchfab API gives us access to 3D objects generated by many artists. Let's take, for example, the clock. We can ask DALI to generate a clock image, which would give us our target image. We can also take screenshots from all, all of the objects that we find in Sketchfab API with that specific text. Then we can use clip embeddings to, bo to both find the image that is closest in text similarity and visual similarity. Once we identify that 3D object that best matches our target image, we can load it onto 3D space. We can repeat this process for all objects and then generate an entire scene. Through other reasoning skills, LLMR is able to place objects in positional intelligent ways. To test the efficacy of LLMR, we ran a numerical study. To do this, we measure error rate, task complexity, iterative improvement, and real time. I'll get more deep into each one of these. Our experimental setup was to have two different types of prompts. The first type on the left were single prompts, and these are single uh, commands that can be executed basically in one step. We also had sequential prompts. So rather than having a single prompt, we had multiple prompts that relied on the previous prompt in order to be executed. So they're essentially sequential prompts that require sub-steps. On the scene side, we had two different setups. We had an empty scene where there were no objects and no scene hierarchy inside of Unity, and an existing scene where there was an existing objects, existing, existing room, with an existing hierarchy. This is uh, the case in which we would expect this scene analyzer to play more of a role. To test this, we turned on and off each of the modules in LLMR to see how performance improves. So here we're plotting average error on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have different variations of LLMR. There's only GPT-4 with zero shots, so no examples. We then uh, tested what how it, it would perform with a few examples, and then we turned on the scene analyzer, and then both the scene analyzer and the skill library. And finally, the scene analyzer, the scale library, and the inspector. On the left, we have performance for single prompts. And on the right, we have performance for single prompt as well, but existing scene. So empty scene versus, versus existing scene. What we find is that as we turn on each module, performance improves in most cases. And when all modules are turned on, 
performance improves dramatically. So it goes from an error rate of almost 70 to under 20. So it's a four times improve, improvement in the case of an empty scene and a three times improvement in the case of an existing scene. As I mentioned, we also measured error rate by complexity. This consisted of t uh, taking all of our hundreds of prompts and dividing them into different difficulty levels from easy, somewhat easy, medium, somewhat hard, and hard. As we would intuitively expect, all type, all model types, so with different modules turned on and off, perform worse as the prompts get harder. But what we also find is that LLMR with all of the modules activated perform best in all cases. This is interesting because it tells us that LLMR is performing better consistently across different prompt levels because it could have been the case that LLMR was only helping in the case, in these in situations where the prompts were easy or somewhat hard, um, but we see this consistent improvement across all levels of difficulty. We also measured average prompt completion. So in the, in the case of the sequential prompts where we have more than one prompt and we have few steps of prompts that depend on the previous prompt. We measure how many of those prompts was LLMR able to complete. And we find that for LLMR with all of the modules turned on, that number is much higher. We also report the amount of real time that it takes to execute, uh, to generate, compile, and execute all the, the code. We find that LLMR does take more time, but this is because there are more modules being activated and used in order to get better performance. The numerical evaluation focused on the compilation and runtime error in the generated code, but we also want to evaluate the quality of the output and the usability of our framework. So we recruited 12 users with different levels of experience with Unity, and they spent about one to two hours using our framework. And here are some of the worlds they've created. The outputs vary from cities to asteroid-like games, and some even recreated their professional work, such as rigging camera angles and generating animations. Our questionnaire results revealed that participants felt that they were able to iteratively achieve their goals and the framework itself is intuitive. We asked about their strategies and approaches to prompting. Some treated the framework as an experimental playground, refining their prompts over time through trial and error. But many stressed their need to be highly specific with object names and parameters to change. We also asked our participants to compare using our framework comparing to their prior experience of creating 3D worlds. Many like the ease of directly describing their ideas and intervene instead of extensive manual scripting or referring to external documentation. Some challenges were due to unpredictable output of the framework compared to tr traditional methods, and thus the choice between the two depend on the artistic nature of the project. Many were impressed by our ability to integrate with um, platforms like Sketchfab and also allowing and accommodating plain language and euphemism rather than strictly technical terms. Finally, we would like to discuss overall learnings, limitations, and some future work. First and foremost, risk and ethical considerations. Our framework serves and is intended as a tool to improve productivity and facilitate brainstorming rather than completely automating the creation process and replacing the human. But a more serious concern is the potential to generate harmful and inappropriate content, which requires proper red teaming. Now onto the limitations. Our current framework requires access to scene graph with descriptions and hierarchy of objects and assumes that the names of the objects and their children components are correct and unique. But this is typically not the case for many models from online repositories. And in addition to the scene graph, it doesn't contain meta information about things like affordances or functions. And the natu natural next step is to incorporate models like large vision models. Similar to how the builder and inspector loop in our framework reduces code compilation error, in general, our framework will benefit feedback from the world, both virtual and real, and from users on the quality of the output. Another limitation of the framework is token size and memory limitations, which comes with most LLM-enabled systems. Even though we have optimized by limiting access to historical conversations, it presents a trade-off where the user prompts may refer to something in a previous exchange. The ability to automatically generate new skills will also expand our framework's capabilities. And currently, our framework does assume unity because large amounts of existing examples of C-sharp code have been seen by LLMs. But we want to highlight that our framework can be adapted to any environment that supports runtime compilation. For example, a web-based approach could further make the worlds easy to share and collaborate within. You can check out our website at llm4mr.github.io 
and we look forward to seeing how this framework will be utilized and expanded upon by the wider community. Thank you.